Hi, everybody, and uh, it's great to be with you here today. I wish uh, the original plan A of doing this in person down in Atlanta was, uh, was happening, but be that as it may, we're doing this via the video. And congratulations to Andrew and the team and uh, everyone at FinTech South for this tremendous event, very important, and it's so important that we all get together during these tough times, especially uh, in the, uh, the rest of the country outside of you know, New York and Silicon Valley. Uh, my name is Jeremy Falcon. I'm head of innovation for HSBC. Uh, we're a bank, a pretty big bank, um, headquartered in London. I live in New York. Our history is in Asia, and uh, my accent is from Australia. So if I've already confused you, it's okay. It's not deliberate. It's just the way we roll. Um, but I think part of being the outsider and that diversity of background and experiences is what helps uh, make me, I think, a, a, a reasonably successful head of innovation when you look at doing things differently to add value to an organization. Um, and of course, the first thing I did when I was asked to do this job at HSBC um, in 2015 when I joined was to create a definition around what does innovation mean, which is doing something differently that creates value. It has to have, um, you know, there's two variables to that. There's two variables to that definition. And as Peter Drucker famously said, you can't manage what you can't measure. So that we have to create something. And you have to change a paradigm, but there has to be some kind of shareholder value, revenue value, expense reduction, benefit economies of scale, customer experience enhancement, that value that needs to be created. Uh, as we know, ideas are cheap. Talk is, talk, is, uh, talk is cheap too. Ideas are free. Execution of those ideas is really, really hard, especially in financial services and in large organizations, <clears throat> which appropriately brings us to the topic of today about making uh, you know, finance more human, candidly. Uh, and I think in this hyper-technology era, and this is why I was so honored when Andrew uh, invited me to be here today to talk on something that this, this topic that I'm particularly passionate about, is in this hyper-technology era, on the one hand, we're being told how this is going to disintermediate people. This is going to reduce the need for people. Um, but candidly, it's actually going to bring us closer together. And let me explain why. If you'll, if you'll give me some, another 10 minutes, I'll, I'm going to do my best to explain why. You know, if you think through human behaviors, you know, when I grew up in Australia, I grew up with an old, old saying that I thought was, was the gospel truth, which is that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. And then when this pandemic and lockdown hit, I thought, well, that's interesting. Let's see if this is indeed true. And I did some, did some research on it, and I found probably the most comprehensive study on patent, patent formation, at least that I found, and it's possible you've, you've got some better data, and I'd love if you could reach out to me on LinkedIn and share it with me to read. What I found from the European Journal of Social Psychology was a study on habit formation that found that on average, it takes 66 days to form new habits. That's the average. The easy habits to form uh, take less than 66 days. The more difficult ones takes more than 66 days, but on average, call it 66 days, 10 weeks effectively, which is very different from 21 days. But, but be that as it may, I'm here living in Manhattan in New York in the heart of, in many ways, the epicenter of where this pandemic has, has, has hit this country. And I'm, I think I'm getting above 180 days inside now. So I've gone through that 66 day cycle three times. There are many habits and patterns that I have formed as a consumer, as a, as a worker, as a human being that I don't think I'm gonna unform when I get out of this lockdown. And I'm not the only one, you are too, I'm sure. And why that's really important is if you think through that change in behavior, you think through, for example, e-commerce. Before the pandemic, e-commerce, buying things online. I, I, I pose this question to you. What do you think the total percentage of e-commerce in the US as a total of all commerce, what do you think that number was? So a trick question. Before the pandemic, that number was 16%. So in other words, 16% of all commerce was online. By, I think it was April or May, so within three months of the lockdown, e-commerce had gone from 16% of all commerce in the US to 
effectively 100% growth in three months. So effectively what the entire history of e-commerce in the US doubled in three months. That should be telling about your consumer, about consumer behaviors, about your behaviors, your buying behaviors, your information consumption behaviors. What does that mean for your customers? What does that mean for your teams? What does that mean for your businesses? Entire new business models are gonna be created based upon changing behaviors that have resulted from this lockdown and from this pandemic. So why does this matter? Because in this era of hyper-digitization, that in many ways, the, the sort of the prevailing narrative would have said, well, in a lockdown world, we have to interact with our uh, teams, with our uh, customers via digital in a social distancing world, that's gonna bring us apart. And in the face of it, that makes sense. But when you actually look at the value of these technologies, and I'm sure there are many companies in the audience that are do doing just this, and I'd love to hear from you if you are, actually what you're doing is freeing up time. So just think about it for a moment. The most valuable resource we have as human beings is time. In fact, it's the most valuable commodity. It's, it's, not, it's not renewable. Uh, you can only sell time. You cannot buy time. And so if you think through the value of the technology, it's to free up time. It's to free up your time as a consumer, as an employee, as a worker, to give you that gift back. And just think through that for a moment, what I just said. Giving you back the gift of time. If we look at the example of Amazon, for example, you know, to go on Amazon and buy whatever it is you want, doesn't take you that long. And that's why we all love it. Oh, it's one of the reasons why we love it. Some of you may not love it, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we love it. I remember being sent, seen it, shown a, um, a presentation at an at a, at a, um, industry event, uh, comparing the amount of time, this was about four, four or five years ago, the amount of time customers were spending on various banks' websites. And it was ranked by the amount of the most amount of time customers were spending as, it, as if that was a good thing. And I remember saying, well, you got this whole graph the wrong way. And they looked at me like I was crazy, probably because they couldn't understand my Australian accent. And thank you to all of you on this who, who do understand my accent. And they were, they were saying, what are you talking about? And I said to them, I said, the amount of time the customer spends on your website is not a good thing because they're not being served. It's not a good customer experience. Now, thankfully, I think four or five years later, the industry agrees. Point being is the, it's taken a long time to get the industry and industries to accept changing customer behaviors. This pandemic has accelerated those behaviors like never before. And that is why this, the timing of FinTech South is so important because we actually have enough data to look at the pandemic, to look at customer behaviors, to understand why it's gonna make us more human. Let me give you a very quick example of three real case studies that my team has led uh, to in some ways prove that AI will make us more human, will bring us closer together. The first is a historic project we'd led that we launched in 2018, deploying the world's first social humanoid robot in a bank branch. Uh, which started in our flagship branch in Manhattan, a robot called Pepper, made by our partners at SoftBank Robotics out in San Francisco. Now, most of you think, what, you know, it, who wants to go to a bank branch, let alone to be with a robot? And you weren't the first one to ask that question. After months of design thinking workshops, uh, studies, data analysis about our flagship branch in Manhattan, we found that 73% of our people's time, therefore our customers' time, was being spent on what we would describe as a binary or generic interaction. A customer walks in off a very busy Fifth Avenue, walks in, lines up, asks where the ATM is, of course, for highly trained staff. Um, they're embarrassed to say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, the ATM's right behind you. Customer wants to know how to deposit a check. They can do it online. They can do it on their phone, remote capture. They don't even have to come to the branch. So this was an embarrassing situation. So we thought if we could deploy a social humanoid robot, that base case could free up time, could reduce that 73% of time that was being in, in many cases wasted on these binary or generic interactions, 
that would be a gift not only to our customers, but to our people. They're highly trained. They want to solve problems. They're not there to, to be, uh, you know, glorify traffic police to say the ATM's here. This is how you deposit a check. That's not what they're trained to do. What we then found was that we had record foot traffic because obviously, you know, this, this, you know, this flagship branch, this high-tech innovation, this world's first humanoid robot, social humanoid robot, in addition to our people. And we found we had, on average, for the first year, upwards of five times daily foot traffic. We also saw after the first year, we saw a 40% increase in new business, new account openings. The results told, told the story. And what we found was that this artificially intelligent social humanoid robot actually enhanced the customer experience, reduced the customer waiting times, helped customers learn how to self-serve, and frankly gave our people the ability to spend less time doing administration and more time trying to solve customers' problems. Because those customers that didn't want to interact with Pepper the robot, that wanted to wait in line and be served, could spend much more time on the buy and the sell side on trying to find out what the problems are. More human experience. The second is we did another partnership with a company called Samsung that you may have heard of. Um, again, world first, uh, uh, initially a pilot, also in, in 2018, to deploy the world's first wearable technology in a bank branch anywhere in the world. And we deployed the, the Samsung uh, Galaxy smartwatch on our, on our frontline staff in one branch initially. Uh, candidly, because we know that corporate communications are you know, backwards at best. You know, we, are, we have computers that are tethered to desks that have 27 different passwords to unlock. We have landline telephones that are, stag that are stagnant. Of course, our flagship branch has 25,000 square feet. There are people everywhere. Customers want to be served when, where, and how they choose. So the thesis was if we could use de deploy wearable technology with a smartwatch on the, on the wrist of our frontline staff in that location, they could serve customers anywhere. And they didn't have to necessarily waste time by unlocking the, the various passwords on their devices to then send a message to someone on another floor to serve a cu their customers here. We had preset messages, like for example, your customer is your appointment is here, uh, think, things of that nature. That a frontline uh, customer service representative was meaning that customer could then literally just turn the bezel on the device with a click of a, a button, say your, your appointment is here to the relevant advisor. There was no PII, no customer data, and then the, the advisor would get a message with a with a little vibration and a little ping. Hey, your customer is here. Your appointment is here, and all they could do simply within fraction of a second is say, I'm on my way, I'll be two minutes late, I'll be five minutes late. Just giving you an example of one use case. And you could please that customer and answer their, their, their greeting um, within literally a fraction of a second as opposed to the old way if a customer comes in, hey, I'm here to see Jeremy, my mortgage broker who sits on another floor. By the time I've unlocked my computer or sent them a call, they might not be at their desk, they're in a meeting, customers waiting, it's a terrible experience. And of course, you're losing eye contact by doing this and unlocking this, and you know, it's a mess. Whereas you could look at the customer, yep, let me get Jeremy, bang, dang, oh, he's, he's, got, he's on his way, so why don't you take a seat down, have a coffee, would you like to meet our robot Pepper, how can I help you today? Human experience. Now, we've since deployed that solution initially in Pilot, and we went to other branches, it's even in our, um, in our Dubai uh, locations in the Middle East, and we've since subsequently pivoted on that project as well to in incorporate uh, social distancing features uh, so that we know with, with watches are within two, six feet of each other um, because of the, obviously the COVID crisis. Um, if, if, if our staff are within six feet of each other, um, we know through the IME number of the devices and the IP addresses and the geolocation, they'll get a little um, buzz notification to say, hey, you know, you're within six feet of another person. So that's an example, again, of how this technology, artificial intelligence, is making us more human in this industry. And I guess the final point is we launched this pre-pandemic uh, in January of this year uh, in uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. We announced a partnership with Google, which I was really proud about, for real-time artificial intelligence translation capabilities for uh, customers to use the Google Nest Hub. Uh, think of Google Translate on steroids for enterprise. Um, and deployed this device um, in a couple of our branches in Manhattan. As you would expect, HSBC, you know, a third of our customers in the U.S. are international or expatriate, like myself, for example. Uh, and many of those customers, and we already know 70% of Amer 70 million Americans, 
uh, English is their second language. We also know that consumer finance is complex. It's complicated. Sometimes it's difficult to understand. Um, and that's if you're a domestic native you know, English speaker. What about if you're not from this country? Your English is not your first language. The barriers to entry for financial inclusion are much higher. And so that's why we wanted to test with the Google real-time translation device in partnership with another co company called Valera, who, who, who worked with Google and us, um, to see if we could, frankly, raise the bar for financial inclusion by deploying artificial intelligence through the, the, the Google devices at our frontline branches to deliver a better first, experience, a first impression for those customers whose English was, was a challenge for them. And what we found was that, candidly, you know, that first impression makes such a difference. Even if you could just greet that customer in, in their own tongue, even if you can't necessarily help them get a mortgage, for example, because that's a very complicated transaction where you need other skills and, and it has to be done differently, but even if you can just greet them in their mother tongue, or well, they could greet you in their mother tongue and you could understand them through this technology, what a difference that makes. What a difference that, that how they think of your brand, how they think of your company, how they think of your people. Uh, will last with them forever. And that's the third case study that is, in, is absolutely in real time in production that I'm really proud of leading to prove conclusively that not only is AI going to make us more human, it's actually going to bring us closer together. And if we can do that in financial services, we can do it in any industry. When we get out of this pandemic, all industries are going to have to work together in addition to technology companies having a bigger role to play as we re rebuild trust with each other, as we re rebuild trust with our people, with our customers, and candidly get back to work in a safe way. And uh, I think I've had a lot to say in a short period of time. I wish we were doing this in person. I'm available on LinkedIn. Uh, Jeremy Balkan, you can find me. I think there's only one of me. Uh, reach out, say hello, let's connect. Let's keep this conversation going. And I hope that next year we'll be doing this in person. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thanks for your time, everybody. Have a great conference.